second order optimization method. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's a delight to be back at Berkeley. So thanks a lot for the invitation, uh, the organizers, and for organizing this wonderful uh, program. Um, I put it stochastic, but uh, some parts of the talk that I'm going to talk about uh, won't be necessarily a stochastic. It's just that um, a lot of these algorithms lend themselves to be a stochastic in some sense. Um, I'm going to take up, um, pick up where Michael left off yesterday and talk about a sort of an alternative class of methods to what Rachel talked about yesterday, which involve uh, a bit more um, you know, bits and pieces, and there are some, uh, you know, many more moving parts, uh, which are called second-order information, second-order optimization methods. And if you are wondering why they call them second-order, are they inferior to first-order or whatever? Just I will, uh, I will explain it um, in uh, in details hopefully. And uh, when I was told to, uh, you know, put up, um, put together slides uh, for this um, overview session. Um, I was sort of conflicted what methods to include because, as you can imagine, there is, uh, you know, decades of research in uh, these sort of things. And um, so, you know, it's hard to pick and choose. So I sort of settled on uh, methods that qualify under one of the three criteria that either I worked on them <coughs> or uh, they were sort of are semi-popular in machine learning. So machine learning people know them or the machine people don't know them at all. So anything in between I removed. Is there and anything in the intersection? Yeah, well, oh, <laughs> you mean no and don't know? All, all of the above, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, there is, yes. Okay. Yes. Well, actually, how could it be? The last two are disjoint by definition, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, but in anything in between, um, I sort of left out. They, they may have worked on the second order methods and not known it. That's true. So actually, I'm going to point out. I'm going to point out to exactly one of those methods. All right. Uh, before I start, uh, disclaimers. Um, obviously, you know, I have only been given two hours, and uh, so I need to be brief. And for that, uh, a lot of the results are just modified, reworded, and so on from the original papers. Uh, and um, also, uh, I won't be able to cover even the methods that I um, I'm trying to uh, give an overview of. I still leave out a whole lot of related works and research uh, and interesting results. OK, so um, the problem is an optimization problem. So you're given an objective function. You want to minimize it over some kind of a constraint set. Could be unconstrained, but doesn't matter at this point. And um, the sort of a format of the functions that we care about um, is uh, given as an expectation of another, uh, as expectation of a random function. Um, and the the random variable, we assume that is you know, following some sort of a distribution, which determines uh, ev uh, you know, what's the likelihood of seeing every one of these observations. Uh, so the likelihood of that is sort of governed by this uh, probability measure. And I can argue that a lot of the problems in machine learning, if not all of them, but uh, definitely most of them, can be written uh, in this format by just playing around with this, uh, with this measure. Um, and uh, the function here, uh, just look at it generic. I'm not emphasizing on any particular type of function. It's just that uh, machine learning, for example, this f uh, subsumes in it the loss function uh, as well as a prediction function. So it's a, like a classification. You have a prediction function to give labels to a, to a data. And if you get it wrong, how much you have to pay. So all these things are incorporated inside, inside f. And uh, the whole average. Um, of, this, uh, of these uh, functions, essentially, in machine learning is called uh, risk. Um, everyone, so this, the emphasis is really, at this point, is that uh, the rest of the talk, I'm going to sort of try to tackle different met or, or give an overview of the methods that uh, tackle solving this problem under certain uh, assumptions, including convexity and non-convexity, uh, smoothness, and also non-smoothness. So it's a pretty broad sort of a class of problems at this stage. And um, another emphasis is on them being high dimensional. So the parameter space that we are trying to find our solution in, it's uh, high dimensional. And uh, most often what we see, and in fact, an example of the cl uh, class of problems that uh, you saw in Rachel's talk yesterday, they're given when you are actually, um, you have a bunch of observations on hand. You know, you're classifying a bunch of images as an ImageNet, and you're given a set of images. 
And that can be also cast as this sort of a problem by just considering P to be the, the empirical or the counting measure over this, this set of observations. Uh, by that I mean that essentially the probability of any set of, set of uh, data points is whether those set of data points inclu is included in your training or not. And uh, if we do it that way, you end up getting the familiar uh, finite sum uh, optimization, minimization problem, or what's known in machine learning as the empirical risk. Empirical for that because we're using the empirical, empirical measure, as it's an empirical approximation to the risk. Um, another thing that, uh, that's important in this whole series of um, um, essentially methods that I'm going to talk about is, is the data, be, the problem being, you know, the big data regime if you're in this uh, framework. If you're solving an empirical risk minimization, uh, you most likely have an n to be large. Now this is in quotation because uh, a lot of people are actually starting to hate using this term. You know, it's going out of fashion, it's loathed. So I promise this is the last time you hear me uh, use the term uh, big data and I will never say that one more time. And instead, I'm going to use uh, the, you know, humongous data instead of, uh, instead of a big data. Um, all right, so in the presence of humongous data, you know, the optimization uh, literature goes back, I don't know how many years, decades and centuries potentially. Um, you, you have a lot of options, but most of those options actually don't fit this humongous data regime because essentially the problem with them is that they have very high pereduration counts. And the modifications that people have been trying to do over the last few, few years, uh, well, you know, for maybe decades, is that uh, to turn these classical algorithms to be more efficient by doing two things. First of all, by turning every iteration to be cheaper, but at the same time, try to maintain the original convergence properties uh, that the, um, the original method uh, enjoyed, to try to maintain that as much as possible. And um, you, saw, you have seen that, you saw a little bit of that less yesterday in Rachel's talk, which uh, within the um, context of first order algorithms, by the way, they call them first order for those who haven't seen this sort of terminology, is because they use uh, first order Taylor expansion, if you will, a first order information, um, and uh, which involves the gradient. And that's why they call them first order information. Now it's, you know, it's not a clear definition, but, but just bear in mind that if you're only using looking at the gradient, you can call it a first order. And they go back, you know, the, the, the example of it is gradient descent goes back to Cauchy, which is, you know, you compute the gradient every objective function, uh, look at the direction opposite to it and take a step along that. Now the important point here that Michael pointed out yesterday is that here every component of the object, the, the gradient is scaled uniformly. So every direction is equally um, essentially scaled. For what it's worth, it's fast because if you're dealing with a smooth and weakly convex problem, you end up getting a rate one over k or sublinear rate and if you have a smooth or a strongly convex problem, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm in your, yeah. Um, you end up getting linear rate or geometric rate. And, uh, but the problem with this is that if you're dealing with the humongous data and finite sum type problems, uh, just generating this or evaluating this gradient is going to be very expensive because you're going to scale uh, linearly with n. And that's why you see methods such as what Rachel talked about yesterday, the stochastic gradient descent, mini batch stuff, which uh, at every iteration you end up getting a bunch of realizations. You choose them at random and you form this empirical approximation to the uh, true gradient. You take a step along the negative of that direction. Now, it's very cheap because if S is much smaller than N, then you end up having to evaluate much um, fewer gradients. But the problem is that it's very slow. It all of a sudden becomes very slow. If you have a weakly convex smooth, you went from 1 over k to now 1 over a square root k. That's a very painful rate. If you have never run this, please do. You'll see that it's pretty much flat after k being 100 or 150. And um, if you have a strongly convex problem, you went from a linear convergence to sublinear. So you lose a, quite a bit at the expense of being per iteration cheaper. So 
What do you mean by rate here? Yeah. Convergence rate, for example, the objective value goes down to the optimal. The, the difference is between the uh, obje objective value and the optimal value. But uh, what is the rate exactly? So you can have, for example, say the objective value at this current iteration. Yeah. Uh, rel you know the difference of that with the true objective, <coughs> with the true um, minimizer, or sorry, the the optimal value goes down with the rate one over k, for example. You'll see a couple of those things uh, later on. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about, I'm not going to get into epsilon right now, but uh, we'll talk about it, because epsilon brings out another, can, opens up a can of worms. Uh, all right, so what people do, they modify these SGD type algorithms to do two things. First of all, achieve the full convergence, so, uh, the convergence rate of the full gradient descent, but at the same time preserve the per iteration cost of SGD, and you see a whole lot of class of methods that do just that. Um, second order methods, however, um, they are called second order, not because necessarily they're inferior or they have to be the second in line. They just use the second order information, right? In addition to the gradient, they also look at the curvature or the Hessian information. And goes back to Newton, uh, that he used these sort of methods to solve the roots of a cubic polynomial. And, uh, very similar to gradient descent, you compute the direction of gradient, you take the negative of that direction, but before scaling the components of the resulting vector, you actually transform the gradient through the application of the inverse of the Hessian. Now what it does, it non-uniformly scales every component of F. What does that mean? That means that the directions that are sort of towards the shallow regions or the regions with low curvature are actually getting magnified and the directions that are pointing towards the steep or the very uh, high curvature regions, they're getting uh, less emphasized. And as a result, if you have something that you've seen in many textbooks that you have a, um, a level set of a quadratic which is pretty uh, ill-conditioned and you see this sort of elongated picture and if you start from here, if you're having a gradient descent, you see you end up getting zigzagging around because you're pretty much always pointing in that direction, whereas when you apply the inverse of the, uh, the, um, the Hessian, you say, okay, this is the direction along the uh, shallow or the flat regions, that region, that direction is going to get magnified, this direction is going to get less um, is going to get um, less emphasized and you end up going along that direction. In fact, in this case, you end up converging with just one iteration. So that's a matrix, correct? That inverse of Hessian yes. matrix. Yes. But I wrote it, that's a good thing you reminded me of. Um, I wrote it this way, but that doesn't mean it's going to be computed this way. This is just, I wrote it that you apply the inverse, but that's not how we do it, and I'm going to talk about how we do it. Um, all right, so non-uniformly scaled gradient, the problem is actually quite fast. You know, you have the locally superlinear convergence rate, and if you're a strong convexity, locally quadratic, globally also linear here also. We can show recently that this is also globally linear as well. Um, but the per iteration cost is pretty high. Even if you don't form this matrix and want to invert it, at the end of the day, you have to deal with some kind of a matrix at some point. As a result, per iteration cost is high. And what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to talk about the uh, methods that try to alleviate this problem, but at the same time, sort of try to maintain these rates. Now, they might not be able to... Uh, question? Yeah, yes. The terminology. What do you mean by superlinear? Well, it's just, for example... Oh, superlinear. Yeah. That means... Um, so, so, if you look at the iteration... And this being the true true solution, if you look at the ratio of this and um, this is zero. So the numerator actually ends up going faster and faster and faster. All right. Um, so 
I've, I've divided my talk into two pieces. The first part is the, uh, the first session, and then the second session, part one, I'm going to focus only on convex problems. For smooth case, pretty much I can say there is not much uh, many competition beyond Newton CG, and I'm going to talk about that various aspect of it. And there's also a non-smooth case. Uh, uh, Newton-type methods are only known to be useful, or at least people think that they can be applicable only for smooth problems. And that's not necessarily true. You can actually apply similar techniques to uh, completely non-smooth problems. I'm going to talk about two classes of such methods. One is the proximal Newton method, uh, and the other one is a semi-smooth, uh, in the context of semi-smooth optimization. The second part I will talk about non-convexity. I'll divide that into two classes of algorithms. One are the line search based methods, and among which I will focus on the BFGS, LBFGS type stuff. The Gauss-Newton, probably less known in machine learning, heavily used in scientific computing, and natural gradient, which is heavily used in machine learning, less known in scientific computing. And um, you can argue that, for example, BFGS could have very well been up here, but I put it down here because you, you can apply it in non-convex problems without really thinking twice. And the uh, second one is the trust region-based methods, which uh, the examples are trust region and also cubic regularization. You might say, hey, this is not really a trust region, but you can argue that it sort of mimics what trust region tried to do. That's why I put it over here. So, and finally, I got time, some discussions and examples. Actually, definitely discussions, but might not be examples. Um, all right, so let's look at Newton CG, and let's just focus on the empirical risk minimization or the finite sum problem. You've got a sum of a bunch of functions, and the emphasis is that for now, either, every one of these sum ends is convex and smooth, and also n is large. I also think that for now, overall, the uh, function, uh, the, the objective function is strongly convex, which implies that you have a unique minimizer. N and D, as I mentioned before, are large. Okay, so how do we go about generating or coming up with algorithms? One way of doing these sort of uh, gen generating iterative schemes are by looking at it's what's known as sort of a local search. What does that mean? That means that at every point, suppose I'm at point xk, and I want to minimize this, this function f, minimizer being here. So at every point, I form some kind of an approximation, local approximation to the function. Here, it's shown a quadratic approximation, doesn't have to be, but uh, I find that approximation, which is easier to work with, I find the minimizer of that approximate function and take that as my next iterate. Hopefully it's gonna be closer to my true solution, I keep iterating like this. And this is sort of given in a quadratic form uh, because this is a linear term and this is a, a quadratic term, but doesn't have to be this way. You can write it many different ways. And depending on what you put in here and here, you end up getting different methods. So for example, if I put the full gradient here and put the full Hessian here, I end up getting Newton method. If I instead replace full Hessian with identity, I get the gradient descent or projected gradient descent. And if I actually remove this quadratic altogether, I end up getting Frank Wolfe or conditional, conditional gradient, I think that's what it's called in some communities, um, which is again popular method in machine learning. Mini batch SGD is by replacing this to be the, uh, the sample average of the gradient and H to be identity. What I'm going to be talking about are two methods, or a class of methods we call subsampled Newton methods, where you either use a full gradient here and subsample the Hessian, meaning that you sample a subset of these indices, form the empirical average only using those samples, and replace, consider it as an approximation to your Hessian. The second one is the one that actually you sample both. So not only you sample the Hessian, but also you sample the gradient, and you can sample them independently or simultaneously, and so on and so forth. All right. Um, so for now, let's look at con unconstrained problem just to make things easier. Most of these results go through almost seamlessly when you put in the constraint uh, in the sub problem. Okay, in the, in the unconstrained, the iterations turn out to be like this. So you still have a quadratic. You find a direction uh, that minimizes this, this quadratic. And you find that direction. You take a step along that direction, right? And um, in here, I'm going to be, for now, putting the full gradient here. I'm going to put the subsampled Hessian over here. So that will be my iterative scheme. 
<laughs> now, first let's talk about global convergence. Michael mentioned a little bit yesterday about local and global. What that means is that uh, global convergence is that I want to start my algorithm. I couldn't care less um, how I started. Anywhere I started, I want to get to my solution. And that's what we're going to talk about for now. Okay, so there are two components in this iterative scheme, right? One is the direction, the other one is the step size. So let's talk about how we're going to do those in this framework. And that will probably answer that question about the matrix inverse. So in order to compute the direction, if you look at this quadratic again, because it's unconstrained, the solution of this, uh, you, you can realize, you realize that I put an approximation here because, because it's sort of unreasonable and also very expensive to assume that we can find the exact solution of this. I'll talk about this. But the exact solution of this is the solution of a linear system involving h and minus a g, which is going to be this linear system. If this was an equality, the solution of this system, because I assume strong convexity, as long as this h is also uh, st strongly uh, what do you call it? positive definite, then the solution of that quadratic boils down the solution of this linear system, and I would like to find that p. And once I have that p, I need to find my step size. Well, one of the famous ones that works beautifully in this scenario is what's known as the Armijo line search, which what we do, we say, okay, we have a direction, we want to find the step size. How long should I go along that direction? Give me an alpha such that if I go along that direction by that much, I end up being smaller than where I started, but also a little bit even, not only just be smaller, but also be smaller by, a, by, a, by, a signi by, by an amount, which is determined by this linear approximation, if you will, of, of the function. And this, this term has to be obviously negative, right? If it's positive, then this doesn't make any sense. It has to be negative, because if this term is negative, then if I have a good step size, then I know at least that my objective value is going to improve um, compared to where I started. And once I have these two, I take a step along those, right? Okay, so, and then I can put everything in this simple algorithm, compute the full gradient, sample from the set of indices. I'll talk about how, but for now, suppose you know how. Go get those samples of indices, compute the approximation of the Hessian only using these samples, Solve this linear system, again, I'm going to talk about how, but solve this linear system approximately, find the p, put the p back inside this, try to find an alpha that satisfies this, and you, that's what it's done, usually it's done approximately using the backtracking line search. I try an alpha here, most often one, and I try to cut it back and make it smaller and smaller and smaller until this inequality is satisfied, I take that step. So find that step. I have two components, I want and I take a step along that direction. Can you guarantee that the line search produces a... Yes, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, so, the very first, I have to say, a seminal paper really that sort of opened up research in the direction of sampling the Hessian was this paper that, uh, well, people before that had done it, but nobody has actually tried to do any theory in this, in this line, and this was the first first work that I know that did that. And they assumed that every one of the components function, remember the function is the sum of these fi's, and they, they assume that every one of these fi's is strongly convex. By that I mean that the curvature is never zero. Every direction you look at, you can put a quadratic underneath it. It's twice differentiable, blah, 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 but if you do that, and if you go through this algorithm, you end up getting that at the limit, the gradient is zero. So you converge to the stationary point, the problem is convex, that's your solution, you're done. But the problem was that the rate, there is no rate, and the issue is, is everything is asymptotic, right? You have to wait infinite amount of time before you actually can say something about your solution. So as a result, people would like in machine learning more to have rates as opposed to asymptotic results, which was a classical goal of optimization. You just wanted asymptotic results. These days, uh, machine learning in particular, uh, they want just rates. I want to know how fast my objective is improving. And the question earlier on, uh, what do I mean by rate, for example, is, is statements such as this, that if I compare um, how far I am right now compared to the optimal solution, compare that with how um, far away I was when I started, how smaller am I now? And 
how that and this difference how fast is it improving at every iteration and this rate of improvement is called the convergence rate so this paper showed that again under the same set of assumptions if I do random a uniform sampling of the Hessian in expectation I end up getting this decrease in objective value and the rate being this and this kappa is the same as uh, what Rachel talked about yesterday the condition number in quotations because there's a whole no you know different ways of defining what condition number is but the problem is that the assumption was that f is only uh, the uh, f is strongly convex a little bit too you know strong of an assumption what if the, or, the overall f is strongly convex, but each individual ones, they are only weakly convex? And you might wonder, hey, is there any possibility of having a problem such as this? And indeed, it is true. Suppose you have something such as, you know, in machine learning, a lot of problems can be written this way. So you have a loss of this, of this, um, of this form. And uh, suppose also my data, these AIs are given, so these are like the data points or the images, if you will, and uh, suppose they're in RD, and if I put them in a, as rows of this N by D matrix, this matrix is full column rank. Um, and if that's true, so the matrix is full rank, and every one of these loss functions, remember this is a loss function from R to R, every one of them is strongly convex then the component function now the, the function as a function of big x so this whole thing if i took look at the hessians actually a rank one matrix so it's not only a strongly convex far from being a strongly convex problem each one of them uh, you have you know d minus one direction of completely nothing and um, but if you add them together you can show that the Hessian of the full function ends up being, in fact, uh, uniformly bounded away from zero. So the overall problem is actually strongly co convex, even though e each one of these individual functions is only weakly convex. And uh, this is where we sort of started uh, to look at this problem. And we said, OK, so suppose we sample like this. What are the conditions that we need in order to only assume these sort of conditions? And we still can run through our algorithm. And it's very simple argument, actually, not difficult at all, to show that if you have a Hessian, you have a strongly convex problem, and each individual functions are only convex, and also smooth in the case, in the context of, you know, the differences between the gradient is not going to explode crazy, then, you know, you, have, you can have these epsilon delta arguments that if your sample size is large enough, and large by that depends on this epsilon, depends on delta, depends on dimension, as well as this condition number kappa, if you sample this many times, you can guarantee with this high probability that you're going to be, you know, always uniformly bounded away from zero. So this sampled Hessian up here, it's going to always be positive definite. Even though individual sampled functions are just weakly convex, the overall sampled function stays positive def uh, strongly convex with this, uh, with this parameter. Okay, so now we know how to form our H. So now let's see how we can get our P. So that was this approximate solution to this linear system. I just showed you that if I do it this way, the Hessian remains positive definite, so I have a positive definite linear system, and I want it to be approximate. How do I define approximate solution? By looking at the residuals, right? So the residual of this problem is how much left-hand side differs from the right-hand side, so left-hand side minus the right-hand side, so that's why the minus now is a plus, relative to uh, some relative error, which is here given by the, some fraction of, for example, if I put zero in here, right? And I put, using CG, can someone tell me why I just specifically mentioned CG? And the answer is not, it depends. <laughs> it actually has a, why, why did I put CG? That's the first natural uh, answer that, that obvious, every, you know, people who know these things will give. And that's very true. H is positive definite, symmetric positive definite. But that's not all, all the reasons why we use it. Because it's symmetric and I, can, I, can, I might as well use min res, for example. In fact, there are papers by Michael I show that min res in certain uh, situations is actually much better than CG because min res 
you look you're actually minimizing the residual of the linear system and that's what we are monitoring anyways so you might as well use min res so the problem is you know, maybe the, the, the answer is it depends, because it depends if I'm thinking about it theoretically or, or practically. Theoretically speaking, I can technically use Mindres as well. But, sorry, practically. But theoretically, when I use CG, what I'm doing implicitly at every duration of CG, I'm minimizing this quadratic subject to some subspace of T dimensions. We call it a cryo of subspace or teeth order cryo of subspace for the teeth iteration. So if I do CG in teeth iteration, I stop. That, that vector I get is the exact solution of this problem. It's a subspace among all the vectors also contains zero. So I can put zero in here. So that means that this PT, whatever it does, it's going to give me an objective value that's better than zero. So that means this, if I plug back in here, it's always going to be negative. And that, if I rearrange terms, that means my direction of descent is the direction that I get. It's always going to be direction of descent because this is a positive definite. So this quadratic is always uh, positive. There is a negative. So this right hand side is always negative. As a result, the direction that I get always going to be direction of descent. And that's what we want as part of a line search. Yes. Uh um, so is it possible that these, uh, um, that if you use these other techniques, you could also prove something? You just so I talked with uh, Michael yesterday. Um, if there is any solution, he would know it. But he, um, I'm not sure if there is one. Uh. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention that min res might be good even when h is indefinite. Sure. And this year, Dominique Auburn and the student have sure. written Paper using for, sure. um, this trust region problem. Yeah, so uh, so it might be you know easier to look at min risk for trust region type problems, but for New Newton type because we emphasize on the direction of descent might be harder theoretically, but practically I am also with the same opinion as Michael that min risk probably is a much better. Uh, thing than, than CG for the fact that we terminate CG by looking at residuals anyway so you might as well do something that minimizes the residuals anyways these were some interesting things that uh, that came up a, a little while ago when I was thinking about these things all right so the, the result is this if I, I have this this tolerance the relative residual so in MATLAB you put in your function handle H you give it the right hand side and you also put it the to relative tolerance right it's three parameters and one of the three, three parameters is the relative tolerance. And we showed in this paper that if your relative tolerance is only in the order of 1 over a square root of the condition number, you see the condition number is large, but thank goodness this is at least 1 over a square root of the condition number. Uh, if you do it that way, then with high probability you end up getting rate, which is very close to the rate of the uh, exact full Newton method, minus this little 1 plus 1 minus epsilon approximation. All right, now let me turn to local convergence. What's local? This is always global, right? So you start from arbitrary point in the space. I want to get to my solution. Local convergence is that let's suppose I'm close enough to the, to the, to the optimal <coughs> solution. And that's what the classical analysis of Newton's method sort of focused on. And still, even today, a lot of papers come out that focus purely on, on local convergence. They want to see how that behaves because a lot of communities they care about high precisions, and that's where these local convergences come out. Uh, machine learning, not so much. Uh, so maybe local convergence is not as interesting, but not everything should be driven by machine learning. So let's just talk about this. Um, in local convergence, if you, if you sort of sample the same way, and uh, you run through the, uh, the, um, the, the argument, you see that um, if you're close enough to the solution, you end up getting an error recursion. So at the next iteration, compared to the uh, current iteration, you get an error recursion, which got a linear term here and also has a quadratic term. And it's famously known as a linear quadratic error recursion. And pretty much doesn't matter how you approximate your uh, matrix. It just al almost always it boils down to being a similar sort of setup. For example, the very first paper that looked at this subsample Newton methods in the local regime regime was, was this paper, which they said, OK, I'll subsample my Hessian. Then I do this uh, truncated SVD. For some reasons that they mentioned in this paper, I don't necessarily agree with those reasons. 
but they do it and uh, you know they say that now we have the uh, truncation um, then we can pretty much implicitly form the inverse let's suppose we do that and now we take a Newton step and then we project it onto the constraint and now we, we go that way. And they showed that if you do it that way, locally, remember all these results are local, they're not global. You have to ensure that your initial iterate rate is close enough. Locally, you end up getting these, uh, quadra these um, um, linear quadratic things, which these, with these constants, the first constant, the linear term, depends on the accuracy of your approximation through the size of the sample. Second term is sort of unrelated in some way, and it only depends on some parameters corresponding to the problem. Right, and that's the, the theme that happens all the time. But there's, I mean, even though they wrote it this way, I just want to make a word of caution of using this type, if you have a constraint optimization, and you do it, take a Newton step and then project Onto. This is known as the uh, two metric gradient projection. One metric because we are using the Hessian to uh, scale the gradient and the other one because we're sort of projecting on uh, with the, with the uh, orthogonal projection. So it's two metric. It's known to have issues that, you know, starting from an arbitrary point, this algorithm actually might not converge. So this is not the way we do constrained optimization with Newton. However, there are classes of algorithms, classes of problems, such as, for example, the bound constraints, box constraints, and those sort of things, where you can do these things. But arbitrary constraints, you can't really take iterations like this. Locally, it works, but globally, you might end up having issues. And um, so we, we, we also did similar works. And he said, OK, so suppose we're doing sampling as before. If you sample this many times, your subsampled Hessian will preserve the curvature or the spectrum of the original Hessian to within epsilon. This sign is just sort of like a, the uh, partial ordering of the mate between symmetric matrices. And uh, if we do that, we end up getting exact same sort of uh, linear quadratic recursion. But the, the, the cool thing about the, the thing that we got was that the linear term depends only on the epsilon or the, uh, the uh, accuracy of the approximation. The condition number as well as the in, uh, inexactness of the linear system solve, right? The second term doesn't depend almost on anything except through that, which you can also ignore this term altogether. So what does that mean? That means that if I get rid of this term, then the linear ray or the, the term that multiplies the linear term can be problem independent, right? It depends on epsilon, which I prescribe. And that turns out to be the case if I set my theta to be of this order, so again, 1 over square root of kappa to solve my linear system. So when you put into MATLAB, put 1 over square root of kappa, th this coefficient becomes problem independent. Now, when we are close enough to the solution such that this term is domi dominating this term and I can ignore that one, now we end up getting a rate that's completely problem independent. And that's what we see in practice as well. And I'm going to hopefully show some, some uh, results as well as the theoretical results that you can prescribe the rate of convergence. This is sort of funny, but that's what happens. You can prescribe the rate of convergence. And you do, if you do things right, at some point, you end up getting that rate of convergence. OK, so it's completely problem independent. This is a property of Newton method. No other method has this, this sort of property. OK? Now, um, and putting all together, you know, local plus global, if you start from an arbitrary point, you have all the way linear convergence. After a certain number of iterations, you turn into this problem independent linear rate. And finally, and most interestingly, actually, to me, is that after a certain number of iterations, you don't need to do line search anymore. Step size of 1. And 1 is a magical number. It's the natural step size of the full Newton method. In fact, when you do a second order Taylor expansion, that's why there is no alpha there, right? It's just 1. It's accepted for all the subsequent iterations. And this is cool because one of the heroes of mine, Professor Nocello, actually says any optimization algorithm for which the unit step length works has some wisdom in it. And it's too much of a fluke if the unit step length accidentally works. In fact, Michael and I and, and, and also uh, Jorge, we all sort of want to define second order methods that the methods that can run with step size of one at, at some certain asymptotic regime. OK, so uh, let me just push ahead and talk a little bit about the exploiting structure and then move on to non-smoothness. Um, so suppose the problem is given as 
the, an example that I gave last time. So support vector machine or whatever, a smooth version of it, right? Then it's very straightforward to see that the Hessian of this, uh, this function, you can write it as a sum matrix transpose, a diagonal matrix times the matrix itself, where A is an N by D, so N is the number of data points, D is the dimension of X, you get an N by D matrix where the rows of this matrix are these data points. And D is a diagonal matrix whose diagonal elements are the second order derivative of L. L is from R to R. Second order derivative evaluated at these, at these points. OK, that has a lot of structure in it. And it turns out that if you have problems like this, you can do stuff that are a bit more smarter than just arbitrary uniform sampling that we saw so much uh, bad things about over the last couple of days, rightfully so. So um, the first work that actually looked at problems of this work is the Palancia and Wainwright from here, that they said, all right, so we have this quadratic problem that I have to form and solve at every iteration, but suppose my Hessian is given in a, some sort of a, what they call a square root factorization, right? I'm given a ma matrix B such that B transpose B give me that. Now this B is different than the B from a Cholesky factorization, if you will, which I, if I had that one, then I didn't have to do any of this stuff, right? It's just simple to solve. This B is, is a tall matrix, so I can't solve a linear system knowing this factorization. It's a tall matrix. Suppose I'm given like that, then can I use anything to speed things up? And we saw a lot of that yesterday, right? So if I put this F as B transpose B, this ends up being the norm of this vector multiplied by b. I, we saw a whole lot of stuff to do yesterday. This is n by d. How we can sketch this b such that we reduce this from n by d to be something smaller, right? So what we do, we stick a, a sketching matrix or sampling matrix in between. Hopefully that matrix is gonna be, it's gonna be short and fat, but it's gonna be less fat than b is tall. And if that's the case, then S times V will be roughly square and of the dimension smaller than N, so hopefully I can work with that much easier. And um, end up getting a sub problem that's much easier to solve. Well, we saw many examples of these yesterday, so I'll go from N by D to S by D. Hopefully S is much smaller than N. None of my sub problems is easier. I'm not going to bother you with it. You know, sub Gaussian, randomized Hadamard, non uniform, uh, and uh, sparse transforms, and so on. You can use anything you want, really. It's independent of, the, of what you use. However, the guarantees that you get in the end in terms of the iteration complexities as well as the uh, running time will depend on the sketching that you use. But it's, uh, you, you, you know, we, we studied a lot of this over the last couple of days. An example is a non uniform sampling that we showed in this paper if you do through um, raw norm sampling, again, this we had yesterday, and leverage score sampling, we end up getting rates that have some advantages over, say, uniform sampling or other kinds of sampling. I'm not gonna bore you with it. There is another line of work that says, forget about the Hessian itself. What I care about is the inverse of the Hessian. So I would like to have a sketch or an approximation to the inverse of the Hessian. That's a tough problem. You can't really have a, an unbiased estimator of the inverse, inverse of the matrix. But uh, these guys say, well, you know, we're gonna make something and do make it work. So use the Neumann series or Taylor expansion of A inverse as long as this is positive definite and bounded by one, this, this, this you can get rid of. Um, and as long as you have this Neumann series expansion, well, all I need to do, I just need to truncate it, right? If I truncate it at some part J, then hopefully what I end up getting is a good approximation to my full inverse. And it's nice thing about it is that you can write it as this recursive that the uh, J depends on J minus one through a recursive recur uh, problem, the recursive equation. The issue is that you have a full A in here, so I haven't done much yet. So we might as well put a subsampling here as well. So technically speaking, they said we want to you know, approximate the inverse, but they needed the approximation of the, 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 the Hessian at the same time. So, but anyways, it's a neat idea. And uh, if you do it that way, you end up getting a three loop recursion, three, loop, uh, net, three nested loop. One is the overall optimization and two of them just to be able to evaluate this thing times a vector. And uh, you end up getting, um, this actually lends itself very nicely to problems such as GLMs and so on. 
Now we have that in our paper uh, at NIPS a couple of years ago where we compared all these, all these methods, including the last one that we mentioned and all different samplings and so on. So I put that for, we heard a couple of times, archival purposes that uh, we can sort of refer back to later on, okay? So um, I'm not gonna talk about the convergence of the gradient because I'm running out of time for this one. So let me just, uh, it's similar, very similar to the case where you have a full gradient. It's just the difference is that if you sample the gradient, then you can only show that you converge to a neighborhood around the solution governed by the approximation error that you have to your true gradient. And you have to come up with ways to drive this, this uh, so iterations all the way to the true solution, but not too interesting really. Right. Less. Did, yes. Did you say the guarantees that you get on the approximation to the inverse? Oh, no, I didn't say anything, but the, uh, it's very close to, sorry, I didn't put it there. It's, it wasn't my work, actually. It's someone else's work, but uh, they have two set of, uh, set of samples, or if you will, um, so one is this sample of approximation A, and the other one is the, how, what's the truncation, and both of them is sort of a probabilistic type, uh, type analysis. I don't remember off the top of my head the samples, but... If you're sampling and then you're uh, doing this recursively, you have dependencies, you're using fresh samples? Uh, um, so I, th I think they rearrange it in a smart way such that uh, um, I think you... Yes, so I think three nested loop at every duration of the inner loop, you sort of draw new samples, if, if I can remember correctly. I don't know, so let me... Know. I'm on the record, so <laughs> let me not say something I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> um, all right, so non-smooth, right? If you ask someone in the street that can you run Newton method, they say, well, even on smooth problems, people say you have to inverse a matrix, which we saw we shouldn't do it. So they say even for that, you don't use it. But let alone you say, hey, this is a non-smooth problem. Everyone like, just get out of here. You definitely can't use second order information. And it turns out that no, there is a whole lot of stuff that you can do and lend themselves with some beautiful theoretical results, okay? The first one I'm gonna talk, okay, so let's, let's set up the problem. It's a sum of two functions. I only had one last time. Let's add another one, which is gonna add this non-smoothness to my problem. Now, for now, let's assume F is uh, smooth and R is non-smooth, right? I'm gonna relax this in a few slides, but suppose you have a smooth plus a non-smooth component. This Think of an L1 regularization or nucleonome regularization, all these famous stuff that uh, people do in machine learning, right? Okay. One thing that you can do is the approach that uh, these guys did. And what they said, they said, hey, we wanted to form a quadratic subproblem problem if we had a smooth problem. I could have just done simply just the Newton type stuff, put the gradient over here, Hessian over here, or approximation of each, either one of them, form a quadratic and go about that way. I don't, I'm not smooth, so I don't have a gradient. But lucky I'm, I'm convex, so I have what's known as subgradient, right? So it collect, it's, it, uh, or subdifferential is a collection of vectors that behave log gradient in a certain sense. So I'm gonna form, instead of this, line, this quadratic approximation, I do what they call it quasi-quadratic or non-quadratic subproblem, which I find a vector from this set of subdifferentials. So I, Consider F and R, don't look at one of them be smooth, the other one non-smooth, like just treat them both the same. And compute the uh, subgradient of this, get the supremum for every P, and then find what P gives me the minimum, right? It's not quadratic, but it is nice. And this H, obviously we can't take the second order derivative that easy here, but uh, what we end up doing, we, so for example, put a BFGS type matrix over there. The point being is that, uh, there's a whole lot of quadratics that I can put in here given every one of these vectors in this. But if I find, if I actually plot this, I end up getting something, this bold red, that's not quadratic anymore. You see there's, it's not as quadratic. But you approximate this in some ways you can say better, at least around the kink over here. The problem is that this is a steepest descent type stuff. And it's known that when you're non-smooth, the steepest direction of steepest descent uh, which we use the subgradient to find that, but it's, it's just not gonna converge at times. And that's why they have a whole lot of stuff around this algorithm to make sure that this converges. Another line of work is the one that actually Michael Saunders uh, initiated a couple years ago, as well as, as well as some other guys, where he said, I have a smooth plus non-smooth, I might as well use this structure and come up with my durations. My F is smooth, so let me put the, uh, the gradient of F over there. My R is not smooth, let me just let it be as is. So I have the linearization of the first term, leave the second term as is, 
or the zeroth order expansion of it, if you will, and then add the quadratic. Now, I still have some kind of a quadratic plus a non-smooth term, but this is much easier, right? Hopefully, this is going to be much easier to solve because it doesn't involve f. And as long as I can solve this problem and this is an easy problem such as L1 or whatever, this is easy to do. Um, Examples of this I'm not going to talk about. Let's see. The, so you just ignore the non-smooth part? You ignore... No, no, you don't. You put it there, but you don't do any approximation. It's like a dead limb. It's hanging on. Well, it is not really because it involves P still, right? So it still involves P, but uh, I'm not doing anything with it. I'm looking at it just as a, like a... Okay, so this, soft prob this is my soft problem, right? So I have a quadratic plus this non-smooth term. And uh, I can obviously solve this exactly. This is going to be impossible. I need to do it in approximately, uh, approximately. How do we do these sort of things? You can show very easy that your, the P, that's the optimal solution of this, is going to be a P that's going to be the solution of this fixed point, fixed point system, whereas this prox, you must have heard prox over and over again when the compressive sensing was just booming a few years ago, the prox was all over the place because of the L1 term, and uh, still is. And so uh, this is the fixed point solution. What is a prox? It's a soft problem of this kind. So the linearization of this quadratic term right here, I turn it linear, the quadratic, leave that again as is, and add a regularization over here. It looks a little bit magical, but it is, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's got a whole host of theory behind it. And if I can find a P that satisfies this, essentially plug P in here and that's the optimal solution, I know that this will be the optimal solution of, of, of that, um, of that uh, sub-problem up there. Well, approximation of that, now you can translate it to the approximation of this fixed point iteration. And you say, I want to find a P, that's okay, it's not exactly like that, but it's going to be close at least it's going to be better than if I plug in zero, right? If I plug in zero in here, whatever I get, I should do better than that. And I put that over here, and that would be my inexactness criteria. And some additional decrease conditions that they're not really, they're, not, uh, they're pretty much trivial stuff to add just to make sure the converges go through. Okay, and you do this step size through a particular line search, and you end up getting results that is, you know, super linear convergence in certain cases. It's the quadratic and, and so on and so forth. So it behaves very much like Newton method, okay? Now, let me go to the, in the last five minutes or ten minutes, five minutes, let me talk about uh, semi-smooth because this is actually probably a lot more heavy duty when it comes to doing theory, theoretical stuff than the proximal type Newton algorithms. Okay, so here I assume that I have a function f. Uh, let's suppose it's, you know, you know, doesn't have to be convex or, or anything, but let's suppose it's convex. But the, it could be non-smooth, right? So I'm, I'm not really assuming anything now. It's just really f could be arbitrary, pretty much. And, uh, and r, I still want it to be convex and uh, could be non-smooth, right? So this problem is significantly more challenging, challenging than anything I put on the slides before. All right. Now, remember from this few slides ago, the proximal Newton algorithms, they had some problems of this kind, right? I can rewrite this to be as, again, another prox sort of an iteration type. So this will exactly be that, as long as I define my prox to be this. So now, if you have seen prox before, prox, you know, uh, of this function r, you have seen it without this term in here. Most often you've seen the Euclidean term. But here it's, it's sort of a mahalanobis, if you will, of, of distance as measured by this matrix h. And this h, remember back then, was an approximation to the Hessian. Okay, so as long as I can define my problems like this, this is... Now, so, so yes. Wait, wait, you said the type is not smooth anymore, but you're assuming it's uh, twice differential? No, I'm not as... No, I said... No, 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 no. I said, suppose in the proximal Newton method, right? Okay. We had, suppose, um, uh, this H could be anything. I'm not saying this is a Hessian. It could be <laughs> some arbitrary matrix as long as it's positive definite. This uh, sort of iteration can be written as this sort of a um, proximal point iterations, okay? Okay, so you're not talking yet about the... No, 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 not yet. H is an arbitrary gradient was the gradient, but H could be anything, as long as it's positive definite. 
And I end up getting that. The idea, let me just get the idea across. The idea of semi-smooth is this. So recall, remember this. Remember these iterations. Let's now look at Newton for smooth problems. Newton was motivated for solving nonlinear uh, problems, nonlinear root findings, essentially, when R is smooth. How do we do that? We compute the Jacobian of R. And we do iterations of this kind, which in the case of the optimization, our function is the, uh, our nonlinear system is the gradient, if you will. We end up getting Hessian times something equals minus the gradient, right? And then we do iterations like that. The idea for semi-smooth optimization is that, let me write down the, um, okay, so for, for the semi-smooth, if you want to solve this and this is semi-smooth, you replace this Jacobian, you don't have a Jacobian, but what's known as the generalized or Clark's generalized Jacobian. I'm going to talk a little bit about those things. And uh, which exists most often even when, well, not most often, but exists when the, the true Jacobian doesn't exist. And if I can do it that way, I can pretty much run through the same type of algorithm. Now, what would be my uh, nonlinear system that I care about here? I don't have a gradient, right? This non-smooth, I don't have a gradient. And gradient equals zero doesn't mean anything. But what is my nonlinear system? My nonlinear system is actually something like this, which you can easily show that th this being zero is a stationary point amounts to a stationary point of your original problem. That if you have an x that's a stationary point of your original problem, this would be zero. Well, then my task is to find the zero of this function. But this function involves this crazy prox operation, which is uh, most often semi-smooth. And then you have to do semi-smooth uh, Newton method. Quickly tell you, run through these, these at least get the terminology across. <coughs> is that what is a Clark's generalized Jacobian? Everybody knows the Jacobian, so what is a Clark's generalized Jacobian? Suppose I have a function that's locally Lipschitz continuous, right? You have this beautiful result that says if you have a function Lipschitz, local Lipschitz continuous, it's almost everywhere differentiable. It's not everywhere differentiable, but it's almost everywhere differentiable. So suppose I collect all the points that this function is differentiable on, and put it in set called dr, and construct the sequence of all these points, Every one of them is different, function is differentiable at those points, and I can compute the Jacobian there, right? So I send these points to a limit, and I just track what these Jacobians are going to. If they, have, if they went to a limit, I'll call that what's known as a Bulligan subdifferential. So I call, define that limiting point as this generalized Bulligan subdifferential, sub, uh, sub, uh, the Jacobian, and the Clark's is just the convex hull of this. All right? So, uh, now I'm defining derivatives, if you will, for non-smooth. Local ellipsis doesn't mean smooth. For non-smooth uh, vector-valued functions. But I just can't be completely non-smooth. I still need a little bit of structure in order to be able to run through this Newton-type stuff. I want them to be semi-smooth. Now, what does semi-smooth mean? I want it to be locally li local, uh, Lipschitz, just because I can define the generalized Jacobian. I want it to be directionally di differentiable, so this Gateau differentiable, so that's a weaker notion of differentiability. And finally, I want it to have this sort of a local linear approximation, but this is different than the, the, what we know, you know, the Frechet differentiability, where your j doesn't depend on, on the direction that you're looking at. Here, your j actually depends on that, and in fact belongs to this whole set of Clark's Jacobian, but the idea of this is that at least locally you can somehow write this function as a linear function, right? Even though it's not the typical linear stuff we're familiar with, but still you can still write it as some kind of a linear approximation. And you can show that cases such as piece, piecewise continuous functions, continuous differential functions actually satisfy this stuff. So the idea is that, all right, I need to find the solution of this linear system. It's non-smooth or semi-smooth, and I can run through uh, semi-smooth type algorithms. They get pretty nasty. They're not really easy to work with. As you can see, there's a whole lot of stuff that, um, if you look at it closely, it just mimics the, a lot of the stuff we do in a smooth case, plus a whole lot of caveats.
but uh, they're interesting stuff. Theoretically, they're wonderful, but uh, practically, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to work with these sets, right? How, how do you compute one of these or how do you, it's not clear, but they're interesting stuff, promising stuff to work on. Um, and one thing that I leave you with is that actually the reason why a lot of these algorithms are interesting, at least to me, are that uh, these proximal mappings we saw, even though they look crazy, but their uh, set of sub-differentials, the generalized sub-differentials they have, they made the elements of there a positive semi-definite. So even though they are crazy looking and you know you wouldn't look at them and a priori know that there is a structure, in fact, the, um, the elements of those generalized Jacobians are positive semi-definite. Not all the iterations uh, of the, uh, lend themselves to that, but a lot of the proximal mappings have, uh, have that. So I think I actually ended up right on time because we started five minutes late. Uh, I, I gave a whole lot of reference, references in here. So if you have, you know, you want to look at more details, there is, you know, a whole lot of references at the end, but I'll stop and then I'll pick up non-convex uh, next session. all very interesting but I I I was having trouble because this is a new area for me mm -hmm. um, kind of understanding when like when does it arise that my function is smooth versus mm -hmm. um, um, so semi smooth when can I compute the Hessian mm -hmm. as simple as this are these things you're going to talk about in the in the second half or, okay so maybe or maybe you have an overview of when do I need this when should I use the proximal um, okay, so maybe I wouldn't really be able to talk a lot about the specific ways of computing these things for the fact that there's just not enough time to do. I'd be more than happy to, you know, go over these things with you if you want, one-on-one -on -one we can talk about all of this. But most often a lot of the canonical examples are obvious, you know, you, you have a logistic regression plus an L1, so you already know that logistic is smooth and the L1 is non-smooth, so now you can choose, right? Do I do proximal iterations? Can I do proximal Newton? Yeah, why not? Because this R, which is an L1, is an easy function. That sort of problem is actually easily done. In fact, it's done with an exact solution. Why not? But now you have something that's a little bit crazier, you know, you might say, well, let me try something else. You are interested in theory, you might say, oh, I just want to do semi-smooth type stuff, even though you might be able to do proximal stuff. So it's, you know, it's, it's not as clear, but I'll be happy to discuss this in much more details with you if you want. Yeah. Um, so is it, it, um, for instance, kind of, is it right to think a proximal step is when you have like a regularizer? Perfect. If you have a non-smooth regularizer, right? If you have a non-smooth regularizer, most most regularizers that we use actually you can plug them in there, and uh, you can do proximal Newton, for example. Yes. So definitely. Okay. Yes. Great. So, so the yeah. general problem you introduced had constraints, but I'm not sure I heard a lot about constraints. So yeah, I mean, as I said, I removed the constraints in a lot of these slides because it just makes things... So I wanted to talk about linear systems, and that arises when you don't have constraints. But a lot of these, like the global and local convergence results that I give, they pretty much go through even if these constraints. But uh, you don't have linear systems to talk about interesting what stuff. What kind of techniques do you use for the constraints? So, yeah, so for the, when you have a constrained quadratic problem, for that, for example, you can use, if you have a strongly convex problem, something like a FISTA, you know, fast iterative software. Well, if it's non smooth, but you can, uh, what do you call it? Like the accelerated uh, gradient descent, for example, to solve the quadratic subproblem. Constraint. Well, it depends on the constraint, right? If a constraint is a quadratic, right, uh, you can do, for example, interior point methods. I don't know. Okay. Depends on the it depends on the constraint. But if it's an arbitrary constraint, then maybe it's easier to and it's easy to project on it. Maybe you can do sort of like a grade projected gradient or whatever to solve this up. It will entirely depend on the constraint. Yes. Uh, when you define in this last part these sort of Jacobians that would be equivalent to some sub differentials. Does it matter from which side you, you take the limit? Right? Do, do, do you need to take it? Because you need to be somehow consistent. I mean, think about two different projects yes. whether you go from the lower or upper. You go from upper. 
So if you look at the, you were talking, talking about the directional derivative? Yeah. Yeah, so you actually go from, so, so, you, so you have the, you set a direction and you go, you send the, uh, the, the scalar to go to zero from, from above. And this actually comes up in the analysis, like is it, does it matter or does it just need to be considered? It's part of a def def definition of this. Um, I, I've never, I actually haven't seen it as part of the analysis of the algorithm itself. It's the definition of the semi-smoothness, if you have that. And most often, these things, you can show something stronger that you know, gives you these results anyways. Yes? Um, about these uh, more general proximal operators, which depends on the Mahalanobis distance. Yes. When you think uh, and work with them, do you uh, assume that, um, I don't know, B is easily decomposable or easily uh, invertible? Yeah, I'm asking because uh, like the type of problem that you write there uh, uh, as prox B something mm -hmm. is an optimization problem in itself mm -hmm. very, very, very often mm -hmm. if you do something like sure. squish, the, sure. squish the quadratic. Sure, but they most often what, what that, uh, that, that, may, oh, okay, so let me, the Hessian in, uh, let's say, for example, here, this B is an arbitrary B. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't come from any, anything. You put it in there, you want to make this iteration as general as possible. Depend on some problem, you might find a B that works here nicely, right? So you can set it to be a diagonal where you can invert it easy, right? In a lot of cases, you have uh, an option to compute, for example, uh, a, a quasi-Newton, which I'll talk about next session. Quasi-Newton type matrices that you can iteratively update the inverse of them already. So you're already given some matrix that you can work with. I talked in broad sense, but you're right. There's a whole lot of stuff you have to think about. You can't just plug in any matrix because it might be harder to solve that than your original problem. Indeed, yeah. and yes. or you would need to have something sure. saying that you don't need the exact solution. Sure, to sure. And that's why I said second order stuff got a lot more moving parts. You know, it's, it's not just a gradient. <laughs> Yeah, let's thank Fred again.